Because a family member has the authority to slap that label on someone, you know, to say, mm -hmm. hey, listen, she's mentally ill. Someone could just be suffering from minor depression and having a bad mm -hmm. day and they could perhaps find themselves in a mental institution. Hi, my name is Neha Shastri. I'm a journalist here at Vice News, and today we're going, to, we're going to be talking about my piece called India's Mental Health Crisis, where we explored how women are mistreated in India's mental health system. Hey, Neha, thanks for coming on the show. Um, we've got a bunch of people lined up who want to talk to you, and uh, let's start with Sabrina, who is calling us on Skype. Hey, Sabrina. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I uh, love the piece. I saw it a bunch of times. Oh, and thanks. my first question is, how do you think this compares or differs from the mental health crisis here in America in regards to women? And well, so that's actually it's a really good question, because I think just kind of as a caveat, I think mental health is a global issue, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it differs everywhere. We have a significant problem in the U.S. where most people who are mentally ill are behind bars, and Vice News actually did a piece on that as well. And um, in terms of the role of women in the US mental health care system, I personally don't know too much about that, but I do know that in, you know, sort of in India and in societies similar to India, women do seem to be further marginalized for whatever reason. I can only kind of, you know, speak a little bit more knowledgeably about what I saw in India, which was that everybody didn't seem to be having, you know, nobody was really treated well if they were mentally ill, regardless mm -hmm. of whether they were a man or a woman. It was just that attitudes towards women in India in general, especially in rural, rural areas and other, you know, sort of parts of society, women were definitely mistreated and men were able to at least get out and get the care that they needed at some point in time. Interesting. I know a lot of mental health facilities, I mean, I'm sorry, nursing homes in the U.S. also um, have a large, a large population of mentally ill people. So when you went to India, was that group of people, um, is, my question is, is there like, are there nursing homes or elderly care where they kind of throw people in and then maybe, you know, society's not aware that they are mentally ill? Or is it such a stigmatized, like, fort looking, this is a mental illness facility or, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it is it segregated or is it kind of like people are just brushing it to the side and not really paying attention? Well, a mental illness is definitely highly stigmatized in India, which is why a lot of people who you know have that have any sort of mental illness are cast away. Whether it's in mental hospitals, whether it's in you know um, places of worship, or whether it's even just you know them being hidden in their own homes. Um, in regards to kind of, I, I don't know, is your question more about sort of the demographic of people in mental hospitals? Yeah, um, there were a lot of older patients that we saw. There were women who actually were in the hospital, the hospital that we visited, Tane Mental Hospital, for up to 40 years. And uh, we actually have a clip about that that we can play right now. Mental health mein kaise hai patient ka ready to itna care nahi karte hai jyada jitna uh, sharirik bimari wagera ho gayi to usse kam karte hai aisa. Bahut sare patients 20, 20, 30 years tak rahe hai yahan pe. She led us into the women's ward, which, unlike the men's ward, could only be accessed through a locked gate. It's very uh, old, but now we have to renew it, but there is a budget problem. So with, without that much funding, you know, where do the patients sleep? Do they have to sleep on the floor? Do they have beds? We are having beds, but they are not sufficient for the patients, so we are uh, the floor beds. So that clip kind of encompassed a couple of problems that we saw in the mental hospital, but the biggest one is just Dr. Guthe, who is the deputy superintendent, was saying that most families, if they bring their female relatives to the hospital, some of those patients have been here for 20 to 30 years and the families don't want them back. Um, so they're kind of lost in the system. And that is something that we see a lot. And from speaking and to, from a lot of people that we interviewed, it seemed as if it was mostly women who weren't able to go back home. People were a little bit more willing to take back male relatives who sought some kind of treatment, um, whereas female relatives were getting the shorter end of the stick, for sure. And these are poor women, or is it a cross class, class issue? It's definitely, you know, that was the really interesting part is that 
it was across sort of, you know, castes, class, whatever it is. And the thing is, is that because a lot of mental hospitals, most of them in India, there are so few, they're all in urban areas. So people who have access to it are going to be people who are at least middle class. Okay. So, wow. um, and we also even, you know, we spoke to another woman, uh, we have a clip actually as well, and she was, you know, probably upper middle class and her husband institutionalized her. And, you know, she was very well, well educated, so was her husband, they were living in Bombay. They were living in Bandra, I don't know if you know Bombay very well, but it's a very nice suburb. So it is definitely an issue that kind of all encompasses all kinds of demographics in India, but we can play that clip right now. What happened the night you were taken away? It was around 10.30 in the night. I was doing some work and my husband told me that uh, he was going down with the kids. Soon after that, there were three people who rang my bell. They said that uh, we are giving vaccinations to people in the building. After that, I just remember getting up in the morning. I realized that I was in a hospital because a lady, she told me that you are in a psychiatric ward. And it was just a prison for me. There, it's nothing more than that. Like, it was a place that I was just dumped and I, I had no way to come out. So you weren't given any explanations as to why you were there? No, no, no. I started asking them, what are you giving me tablets for? What is this medicine for? They would not say a word. They would just tell me, just have it and finish it off. I was uh, given, uh, like, you know, ECTs and I was not told about it. So you were given electroshock therapy with no consent? Yeah. I went unconscious and after that, I don't know what, what happened. But what, the side effects were like I was turning to be a vegetable. Like, you know, I was not sick, but I was like, I was being made sick. So that, to me at least, you know, when I spoke with Vidya, that was particularly shocking to hear was that, you know, she came from a really good background. She was, you know, married, she had two kids, she lived in a nice house, and all of a sudden one day she finds herself in a mental institution. And when I asked her, actually, something that we didn't show in the piece was um, I asked her if she knew a lot of women that this happened to and she offhand could name at least three other people. Wow. And these are, you know, I assume her peers. So I think that the, the problem seems to be just sort of that mental health is such a huge stigma and it's a, an issue that kind of is all-encompassing and that's kind of why everyone, anyone really, rather, can find themselves in these situations. Interesting. Uh, do you have any other questions? No, not right now. <laughs> okay, all right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks, Sabrina. So, hey, Neha, we actually got a tweet that I want you to take a look at. Sure. And uh, this is from Shashank, um, who wants to know, uh, now that we know a little bit about government mental health institutions, what about the private sector? Are private sector mental hospitals any better in India? Uh, yeah, no, that's actually a really good question. Um, what is interesting about that is that there is a difference between private mental hospitals and government-run mental hospitals just because of private funding. So their conditions, we didn't visit any of those, but from what I've read and what I've heard, the conditions in those hospitals are definitely better. The problem is, is the same, though, when it comes to government institutions, is that these private hospitals are in urban areas and they cost money. So the people who are going to be put into those hospitals can afford it, and it's not really kind of helping the larger issue, which is that there are people in rural areas not getting the care that they need. And up to 60% of India actually lives in these rural areas. So even though the private sector might be doing a pretty decent job, it's not really tackling the problem at hand. Cool, I hope that answered uh, your question, Shashank. So um, let's say hey to Alexa, who is calling us from, I believe, Palo Alto, California. Is that right, Alexa? Yep, that's right. Hi, Neha. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Um, so I'm curious about transparency. Um, you and your cameraman got some incredible footage from, from many different sensitive areas, um, you know, from the mosque outside of Mumbai to inside the, the government-run health institutions, um, even inside the ECT rooms. Um, and I guess I would have expected these places to refuse visitors or sort of mm -hmm. at least hide their condition. Um, so my question is sort of how aware is the general population um, of the, sort of how bad the conditions are and um, is the attitude of openness reflective um, of a lack of acknowledgement or more was it a conscious choice that 
uh, with more media attention would potentially cause cause reform? No, that's actually that's a really good question. So in terms of our access into the Dharga and then also the mental institution, I guess it, it was two separate sort of different ways that we tackled it. With the Dharga, we actually worked with an NGO that goes there every week. And it's just, you know, it's a group of uh, people who go in there and they try to convince families to take their relatives out and actually get them treatment. So the, the way in into the Dharga was really just that and being able to sort of go in with this group that is trusted by the community. Uh, needless to say, though, while we were in the Dharga, it was clear that no, they didn't really feel like what was happening there was they were doing anything wrong necessarily, if that makes sense. You know, I had actually a councilman who kind of, you know, he's on the board of the Dharga, take me around. We actually have a clip of that that we can show and then I can keep talking about it. So he was pretty open in terms of, you know, being very uh, straightforward about the fact that here are all the patients, they're here because they're mentally ill, and here is our process to cure them. And there's a couple, one of them was, as you saw, sort of, you know, the ritual with the limes. A lot, some people were actually even chained to the mental institution, or I'm sorry, not the mental institution, they were chained to the Dharga. And so their legs were sort of chained up to the gates surrounding sort of the border. It was like a square sort of um, shape. And um, the thing that struck me the most actually was that um, despite the fact that they knew that they were treating some sort of illness in whichever way they were treating it, the councilmen referred to them as, in Hindi he says pagal, which still means crazy. So that's, you know, it's as if they don't even use that term mentally ill at all, you know, they say pagal. Yeah. So um, that stigma is still there. And I think that the reason why they let us sort of take a look at what was going on is because they know that they don't have, you know, there, there is no access in rural areas to medical facilities to treat mentally ill people. So I think right. that in their minds, they definitely thought that they were at least doing something, um, which I, in a, you know, to a certain extent, I agree with as well, but it definitely does not sort of treat them at all. It right. results in abandonment and, you know, maybe some people get worse. Uh, in terms of the mental hospital, that was, that was quite a process. Um, the reason why we actually even decided to start thinking about doing a story like this was because there was a really, really good Human Rights Watch report that came out in 2014, exactly about how you know, mental hospital conditions in India are quite decrepit, that there's so few mental hospitals and that women are particularly marginalized within this system. And one of the hospitals that they profiled was a hospital that we visited in Stane, mental hospital right outside of Mumbai. And um, through that report, we kind of got in touch with a couple of, another, you know, a couple of community groups who are working with the hospital. We actually were, our way in was through a group that works directly with the hospital in bringing in mentally ill people. So they sort of are complicit in this whole process. And when we went in there, I didn't think we were going to be shown that much, to be honest. And a lot, right. of, a lot of the footage that we got, you know, it's a very open plan. It's a, quite an open space. So we were sort of walking around and, you know, the men were walking around f freely, the patients when we were there. Um, mm -hmm. And we noticed, obviously, as you saw, women were kind of behind this gate. When we got into the, into the women's ward and we wanted to see the ECT room, um, again, I think it's a question of the fact that they didn't think that some of the treatment that they were giving was, you know, as a Western, I mean, I'm Indian, but as somebody who's grown up in the United States and knows that electroshock therapy is highly stigmatized, is hardly used anymore. Um, I don't think that they thought that that was necessarily a problem. So I think that's why we were able to be shown. But at the same time, it's not really these people's, you know, the people who work at the hospital, it's not really their fault because they're doing right. all that they can and they don't have funding. So. You know, they sort of just were like, okay. And she says that. She goes, you know, I don't, we don't have funding. You know, there's definitely a lack of support over here. But these people keep coming in, and we have to find a way to house them, and we need to find a way to treat, men, to treat them, and this is all we know. So. Right. That sort of leads me to, to another question that I have. Um, there, there was a mental health care bill that was introduced to the Indian Congress in August of 2013, mm -hmm. sort of promising fair treatment, better access to, to mental health. Um, and sort of promoting respect for the rights of, of those who are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So 
as far as I'm aware, that was introduced but not actually passed. Um, Did this bill come up in your conversations with mental health activists, NGOs, uh, medical professionals? Um, And if so, how did how did people feel about it? It was, yeah, it came up quite a bit. Um, A lot of people sort of expressed a little bit of disappointment just because it had been sort of sitting there and stuck in the legislative processes for a couple of years. But um, a a few people that we spoke with, a couple of activists, also sort of expressed a little bit of disappointment in some of the measures in the bill because while... You know, while it sort of does tackle, I mean, it, it, it does some really good things. It decriminalizes suicide, which is a big, you know, I mean, suicide is like the second lead, leading cause of death for young people in India. So, you know, there's a major problem in India and those sorts of measures should be taken. However, the bill doesn't really talk very much about um, adding in more funding. And since that bill was introduced in 2013, India's health budget just in general has been slashed by the Indian government. So even if this bill were to be introduced tomorrow, um, I don't think that it necessarily is going to tackle, I don't think a piece of paper is going to tackle the attitudes that people have towards mental illness. And I think that if the government were to actually implement more programs, open, actually open more hospitals and give them the funding that they deserve, then we could tackle the attitudes and the problems that mm-hmm. are seen. And I mean, that's my personal opinion. And people were sort of, you know, I think optimistic about the fact that at least we're talking about mental illness now in India. You know, before it was very much swept under the rug and, you know, you either put your family member away or you don't treat them at all and you just hide them and you pretend as if, you know, they don't even exist. So it it is, it's definitely kind of um, a mixed feeling about it. But I guess at the end of the day, it still hasn't been passed. So we're still seeing these problems. Right. I mean, it seems as though you know, I'm, I'm curious because it seems as though India is really struggling with this, obviously, and it's and and India is also a country that that is considered some you know more modern than than many other countries who um, are you know developing and who are affected by by similar problems. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk just a little bit more broadly about I don't know what it is about maybe India's political or social cultural uh, landscape that makes mental health still such a spiraling problem. Uh, for a country that's developing in many, many other ways. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think that the best way to sort of answer it is also to look at the fact that the U.S. has a, stra- a staggering mental health crisis. You know, I mean, we don't know how to deal with mental illness over here at all. And China, for example, which is another sort of, you know, emerging world power, probably, I mean, already considered a world power, only 5% of mentally ill people actually get medical treatment in China. So I think that, I mean, it's definitely sort of, it is such an, you know, it's an interesting topic in the sense that mental illness is very hard to understand. And in a country as big as India and with so many people living on the fringes in rural areas, it's very hard to get that kind of education out there. For, uh, you know, for something, mental illness is important, but there's a lot more on people's plates to worry about. I mean, endemic poverty, just economic right. issues, infrastructure, where I think me- mental illness, at least in India, just kind of falls to the bottom of people's priorities. And I, I mean, I think that happens in a lot of places, but I think particularly in India, that's probably why there's so little focus on it. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Neha. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. All right. So, hey, Neha, we just got this tweet, like, literally two seconds ago from Ariel, who wants, I know, the internet, it's crazy. Uh, (laughs) Ariel wants to know, after all your research, do you believe that the mental health system is truly trying to help people with mental health issues? I think she's referring specifically to India. Specifically to India? Well, I mean, yes. I I think that if they didn't want to help people, they would have these systems in place at all, right? So I think that they definitely want to help these people. They definitely want to treat these people. Uh, Nobody wants to kind of ignore the problem, but I just don't think that they have the resources that they need to do it properly. It's a good question. Yeah, cool. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks for sending it in. And... uh, Speaking of questions, uh, we've got May, uh, who is on Skype, and she's got some questions for you, Great. I'm told. So let's say hey to May. Hi, May. Hey, Neha. How are you? I'm all right. I'm kind of cold, but it's fine. Yeah, How are me you? too. Uh, <laughs> well, I got some really easy questions for you, some softballs. <laughs> um, 
So uh, my first question, I guess, was already answered in terms of government initiatives that are mm -hmm. um, in place to tackle misconceptions um, regarding mental illness. Sure. I guess there are none that are actually being earnestly implemented. Is that yeah. the sense that you got? A little bit. I mean, there is. So there's this mental health bill that um, was put into Congress in 2013, late 2013. And part of that actually, you know, in a sense is saying that because right now the problem with mental illness and people who are deemed mentally ill in India and in, in the laws, like when you read the legal language, it's that they call them of unsound mind, which is like a very, very backward mm -hmm. way to talk about somebody with mental illness. And so if somebody is being deemed of unsound mind in India, they're legally incapacitated. So they cannot decide their treatment. Um, and it's up to either sort of, you know, a family member or whoever is their guardian. And if for lack of those sort of, you know, people in your life, then a judge basically decides what happens to you. So it's sort of, it's like a very interesting legal process. And a part of this bill basically says that if a person is well enough, they can decide their treatment. So that's, that's a big change, but that hasn't, mm -hmm. that hasn't happened yet. So, um, right. So I think the intent is there. They do want to tackle it, but you know, it, it just, it just doesn't seem to be a priority, but also, I mean, things in the government, getting laws passed, getting bills passed is going to take forever in India. It takes forever right. in the States. So, <laughs> Right, yeah. right. No, totally. Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about stigma. Um, so my next question is about stigma and shame. Um, mm -hmm. So these two attitudes are like dangerously and in inextricably linked to psychopathology around the world. Um, so what can advocates do on the ground to fight these really often deadly ideologies? You know, that's that's a really good question and it's a tricky one. And I guess it's kind of, you know, what people are trying to tackle. What we saw or what I've read when we were looking into the story and as we kept, you know, producing it, um, is that there is a sort of general social stigma attached, not obviously, not only just to the mental, the person with mental illness, but to their families. Mm -hmm. So in India particularly, you know, we saw that, um, for example, in a lot of the rural areas, if you had a daughter, if you had a daughter and a son, and your son was getting married. Weddings are, as you know, I'm sure in India, weddings are a really big deal for the family. And right. to sort of, um, you know, not be feel shameful, and you know, to look good for the, you know, the family that you're marrying into, a lot of people will mm -hmm. actually use that as an opportunity to put their daughters away. Um, and you know, if people are visiting the house, I mean, we heard a lot of anecdotes of you know people kind of keeping their daughters. Right to the side, keeping their daughters locked up, or like just not really right. talking about the fact that she exists. Um, so that, that's a big, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, there are a lot of community activists who are trying to sort of tackle this, but I think that this is one of those problems where if you don't have systems in place coming up from the top, it's never going to trickle down. You know, you can try these grassroots movements and people, there are a lot of community sort of efforts. But if you don't have the government telling you that you don't have the government opening up more mental institutions or you don't have more psychiatrists coming into the workforce, actually acknowledging the fact that it's OK, you know, you know, even, you know, having right. depression is fine or, you know, schizophrenia is it's fine. You know, we are going to treat this. We're going to tackle this things aren't necessarily going to change. But I'm also actually curious, so I don't keep rambling. Uh, what do you think would be a good way to tackle this kind of problem? Well, um, so I'm currently getting my master's in smart technology and psychopathology. So um, at least in Africa, they are using tech. They're using mobile like uh, telehealth in order to kind of tackle um, yeah issues regarding the underserved. So, I mean, I'm really interested in how maybe technology can be integrated into mental health treatment. Um, that's what I think would be like the next frontier of psychopathology. Mm -hmm. um, and if perhaps like grassroots leaders were able to disseminate, you know, everyone has a phone. I used to live in Zambia um, in, the, in the bush and still people had talk time and they had flip phones. And um, so there's access to these to these folks, and I'm I'm wondering if mental health professionals can um, can access these folks for care via uh, a mobile device. Mm -hmm. That's probably the route that I think things could go, um, rather than a top down um, initiative. Yeah. No. I mean. Um, yeah. That, no, that's actually <laughs> no. That's amazing. That just blew my mind. Um, yes, of course, because I think. At least, I mean, speaking about India specifically, as I had mentioned before, 60% 
of India's population lives in rural areas, right? So, I mean, there's going to be, there's going to have to be a lot coming down, coming down from the top to sort of get those people care, even if these initiatives are put in place. So a solution like that, I'm sure would be, you know, it, it would change a lot of things. Yeah, and training community leaders. Um, that's what we did in Peace Corps, um, mm. which kind of leads me to my next question, actually. Um, the part uh, in the video about faith healers, mm -hmm. I found really, really compelling because that exists not only in India, but all over the world, especially in Africa, um, mm -hmm. with prayer centers in Togo and Benin and so forth. Um, so these faith leaders tend to wield a lot of power uh, within their respective communities. So my question is, how might human rights activists work with these leaders? as opposed to against them um, in order to help those who are suffering from actual mental illness? Well, so uh, what we actually saw when we were in Chaliskau and we went to the Dharga over there, there is a very small, it's a very small village. So there was a very small NGO. It was maybe about a dozen people who are going into that Dharga every Thursday. And, you know, a lot, their intent is to educate people and try and get people out, you know, try and say, hey, listen, you don't need to bring your daughter, your son, whoever it is, you don't need to bring them here. You can get them treatment. And they sometimes try and bring in um, psychiatrists from out of town who will come and treat them. So there are those initiatives, but there is, because the Dharga over the years has been the only source of, of treatment for these people, mm -hmm. it is very hard to kind of tackle something that people are so used to kind of turning to. And when there is such a gap in access to this kind of um, treatment and healthcare, people are going to turn to something that, you know, a higher power that's they feel like is going to help solve something so it is it's difficult and when we were there we saw you know the, there was two men and they were walking around trying to talk to people but they just you know it's very hard so they said that they right. have successfully brought you know they've brought a few women especially out of the dharga and kind of you know rehabilitated them gotten them some form of treatment but it's it is a struggle so so sorry as a quick follow-up so are sure. these faith leaders then um open to working with kind of modern science and um, psychiatrists or is there kind of this uh, barrier there? There's definitely a little bit of a barrier and I think that you know for the Dharga that we went to at least you know it's it's become a little bit of an icon in the region in terms of you know you can we can solve your problems you know it's because people don't just go there there's a lot of people there for mental illness but I talked to a man who said he had a stomach tumor a few months ago and no longer has a stomach right. tumor because the faith healer helped him and um, of course, yeah, of course. Um, but it was interesting <laughs> because you know they, they they are there just to make money, you know, to a certain extent. When we talked to this, we talked to this woman, Sushma, who had left the Dharga and she was just saying, she was like, listen, you know, they cut some limes, they told me to drink the holy water, but they aren't really doing anything and they just, they're just doing this so, you know, my family will pay them money. And that's the unfortunate side of it. And I don't think that that's necessarily widespread, but that's definitely what we saw, at least in the place that we went to, so. I think that's pretty commonplace as well. Yeah. Um, so my last question is definitely the easiest one. So have fun with this one. <laughs> um, last month, the United Nations announced an initiative to address mental illness globally. I mean, uh, mental illness is never mentioned in the Millennial Development Goals. So mm -hmm. this, this was pretty big. Um, even though it's a fledgling program, um, it is still the first time the UN has put anything viable forth. So with that said, um, what are your predictions for the future of not only mental health, but women's rights in India? You know, I think what's really interesting about, I mean, India is such a big country, right? So in terms of the way that at least women's rights is evolving, I mean, I remember the only thing you would ever hear about India a couple years ago in 2012 was about how gang rape is endemic and women have no rights and it's a terrible place to be if you're a woman. and. Right. As an Indian, I remember hearing that a lot, hearing that kind of rhetoric and thinking, well, first of all, that's not true. And second of all, that is a problem around the world. Women rights, women's rights is an issue everywhere. And, um, and, and it's interesting the way that it's evolving. You know, there are a lot of really, you know, great sort of feminist voices coming out of India. Uh, women's rights, you know, girls are getting educated more. Um, femicide is still a thing in some rural areas, but it's actually something that is evolving and it is changing. And it, and I think that 
It was interesting because we talked to this um, this girl who is a mental health advocate. She's schizophrenic herself, and she um, also is a women's rights ad advocate. Um, she never made it into our piece, but she and I, you know, had a really, really great discussion. But we ended it on the note where we basically came to the conclusion that, you know, in order for what we saw, at least in you know the story that I did about how women are treated in the mental um, health system in India, in order for that to change attitudes towards women have to change. They have right. to change. And that is, right. it's evolving, but it's evolving very slowly. And it's a very big country and it's a very traditional society in certain areas. So in terms of predictions, I can see it myself. I see it changing, you know, I mean, I have, you know, friends and family there and it's a very different place from what it was 20 years ago, even five years ago. Right. So in terms of predictions, I think, you know, the mental health is a very difficult issue to tackle. And it's going to take a very long time for that kind of system to really be seamless and to be without problems. And I'm not sure if that'll ever happen. But I think that in terms of women's rights, that's that's changing. And it's because women are taking it into their own hands. You know, we don't have male advocates in India. We do, but we don't have them in charge of the discourse of feminism and what women right. can do. And that's really what's right. going to make a difference. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering thank those you. questions. I really, really enjoyed your piece. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you for teaching me something. So it was great. <laughs> we can talk about it anytime, anytime. <laughs> thank cool. you. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, thank you, man. We're definitely going to keep this conversation going. And now we're going to do something a little different. Uh, I see Sabrina uh, in, in the back control room. And I know she's burning to ask you one more question. So All let's, right. let's uh, send Sabrina back on uh, and say hey. Hey. Hi. I, I'm back. Um, I just had one more question, actually. Watching the video um, and seeing the women there, how many women, I don't know if you could tell from speaking to them or look, looking at them, were actually mentally ill as opposed to women who, had, who have been drugged or maybe electroshock therapy into being mentally ill? Like, what is the rough percentage of who is actually sick? Right. I think, I mean, that, that's hard. That's hard to tell. I do think that there are definitely more people who have a form of mental illness who are committed into these institutions. I think the gray, the gray area over there, though, is that, you know, because a family member has the authority to slap that label on someone, you know, to say, mm -hmm. hey, listen, she's mentally ill. Someone could just be suffering from minor depression and having a bad mm -hmm. day and they could perhaps find themselves in a mental institution. So I do think that people are struggling with something in those institutions. There has been an argument that being in those institutions has made people, you know, worse, have so, made their conditions yeah. worse. Um, but I think on the other side of it, a story like Vidya's is not necessarily uncommon either. Mm -hmm. um, and as we talked to, there was a um, sort of an expert voice that I spoke with. Uh, her name is Dr. Davar. She heads up an NGO specifically tackling issues with women with mental illness. And she was just saying, mm -hmm. it, is, it is the easiest way to get a divorce. You know, without without having to give land or money or anything. Okay. No, yeah, it's the easiest way to say you can petition the court and say, listen, my wife's mentally ill. I need a divorce on grounds of mental illness. You can institutionalize her. And the process is simple. Um, Vidya is amazing, by the way. She's great. She she found herself out of the system, which is very uncommon. But she also now is actually fighting in court against those allegations. So okay. she's doing she's doing great. Um, so yeah, it, it is scary. Yeah. So she yeah no because she's saying you know you slapped this label of mental illness on me. I'm not sick. I don't have a history of mental illness, and you're trying to divorce me without giving me any sort of alimony, and I'm not going to stand for it. So she really ended up being like a very, very powerful person that we met. That's awesome. And going back to what May said, I feel like going from the ground up might not work because of what you were saying with people are, people stand to gain from this. People, faith healers stand to gain money from this. Mm -hmm. So I think a big part of it might be education without even involving these faith healers. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that what when when you look at grassroots movements the people who seem to have more power are the faith healers rather than the community-based organizations and it really does need to come down to education and awareness which can only really happen through government institutions and the government itself so cool thank you thank you all right yeah thank you sabrina and um with that yeah you reached the end of the show so why don't you say goodbye to everybody watching at home 
All right, well, thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't seen the piece yet, it's called India's Mental Health Crisis. And later today, we're actually gonna drop an extra scene about some community initiatives that are tackling the problem. So thank you very much. If you go into any mental hospital in India, you will find that men still go home, you know, after a point in time, families are willing to take them back. But women are there for life. There is no law or policy which governs what can happen inside an institution. We've heard about sexual abuse, over-medication, forced drugging, uh, forced shock treatments, seclusion, solitary confinement. A doctor can do anything to the woman and no questions asked. 